All right, let's continue our exploration of OS and R, Oubliette's Sorcery and Reavers. Published by RuneForge, written by Scott Welker, and available in places like Drive Through RPG in PDF or print on demand. All right, this section is going to be about that section, which I think is most commonly asked about when people learn that the game is related to or inspired by or adapts d20 that is conflict or combat and this chapter is a very succinct and concise and tactically interesting take on just that magic is a very close second and we'll be talking about magic in the next video magic and likely social conflict so the chapter opens up with initiative right out of the gate, which is a good decision, I think. And it does so very interestingly in a callback way, way back to the early days of D&D when different types of attack would determine when initiative was handled. So we get ranged, magic, movement, social conflict, the use of a class talent entering into melee, or... Things related to dying. This is the structure of actions that could take place within one round. And initiative in this game handles initiative on a round-by-round -round basis or turn-by-turn. -turn. So we resolve everything and then we roll initiative again. Now each one of these actions is assigned to die type. So that ranged is in order, expected to come first and Dying is expected to come last, so the type of die increases, meaning the possible range of numbers expands. So, rolling low is what you want to do on initiative. One is good. <laughs> so, ranged attacks are given a d4 to roll. Magic, movement, social conflict, using a class talent, and that's it. Use a d6, and... Melee is a d8, and dying is a d10. So that is the expected order of those things to take place, but not the guaranteed order, which gives us the, that sense of chaos in combat. Now, I should put in a caveat here that I have not yet played the game. So if you're under the mistaken impression that this is a review of the game, please disabuse yourself of that notion now. It's not a review. It can't possibly be a review because I haven't played. Now... What if, after your declaration of action, that action is no longer possible and you have to change to a different action? Does this account for it? Yes, it does. And quite simply so. If you need to realign your action in some way, you'll simply be going on the last possible initiative for that type of action. So if you were doing a ranged attack and you're going to be doing a different ranged attack, you'd move from whatever you rolled to a four. But if you were changing from, you know, like launching an arrow with your bow to smashing someone over the head with your bow, using it as an improvised weapon, then that would be a melee attack and then it would go on an eight because melee is assigned a d8 for initiative. So that gives us a good amount of fluidity, keeps the game moving, no lost actions, and so on and so forth. A little bit of chaos, a little bit of order. I like it just fine. Hindrance appears if you're trying to do more than one thing and squeeze it into that initiative, which might be moving a great distance, such as that would require the full turn's movement, and trying to cast a spell or, or fire an arrow at the same time, you're doing more than maybe you should, and so hindrance will be applied. We'll talk about hindrance, though, later on. The next section is talking about range, and range is presented in this game in an abstract form, meaning it's not using grids, it's not using hexes, it's not using inches, it's not using meters, it's expressing range the way that we actually express range. Meaning, am I close enough to, to punch him? Do I have to step in to punch him? 
Do I have to run across the room to be able to, you know, wade in to punch him? How far away am I? Can I realistically just pop him now? Do I have to do some maneuvering? Or do I actually have to commit myself to changing location from here to there? So am I close? Am I near? Or am I far? I think this is really helpful. This greatly increases the speed and comfort of abstract play, what sometimes gets called the theater of the mind. And, you know, it's it fits in line with what we tend to actually do at the table anyway. So that's range. Range is simple. Initiative is simple. <laughs> How about attack and defense? Well, this is an opposed role, so therefore it's simple. Ultimately, two dice are going to be rolled. An attacker will roll a d20, and a defender is going to roll a d20. They'll do it at the same time. They'll do some arithmetic of modifiers. They'll compare, and the person with the highest number wins. Yay! And then we get to determine damage. So how does this actually work? Well, first off, armor and the whole idea of armor class is gone. So instead of rolling against a target number, armor class, and seeing if you are successful in being able to apply damage. Instead, we're going to be imagining the opposition, the actual struggle. And this struggle is going to last for the period of time that the initiative covers. Right? So these, these characters will be launching their attacks, whatever they happen to be, during that period of time. And their relative success will be determined by their opposed roles. You have to beat the other person's role. So this is a very physical analog to the idea of combat, the imagination of combat. And for a lot of people, it can be a very engaging way to do this kind of fantasy roleplay. So if you've played Palladium Fantasy, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So the defense is a d20 roll. Your dexterity, as we described uh, in an earlier video, is going to be applied, its value will be applied to the d20 roll. And you may have miscellaneous modifiers as determined by your specific character and the material they're carrying and the magic that's been cast upon them and so on and so forth. So defense is going to be something that is uniquely your character. So this is something you're going to have to prepare for and track. Attack is the same thing, or it works the same way. It's going to be tied to miscellaneous modifiers that are specific to your situation and play and something that you need to be aware of. How it works is you roll a d20, you get the expertise die related to that combative action, if it actually applies, if, for example, you're using a melee weapon that you've been trained in. You get to add your dex bonus for melee or your wisdom bonus for ranged. The game warns you there may be some situations, such as using a weapon you're not trained in, where your expertise die will not apply. All right. Then it reminds you that if you are very close when you're trying to perform a ranged combat or uh, magic activity, when you're right up in somebody's face, then you're going to be doing that with hindrance. All right. So if our attack is successful, if our defense was a failure, then we're going to be encountering armor, and armor is going to directly reduce damage. Damage is going to be determined, once again, by your specific character, such as by their occupation. You're going to get a class die and applicable modifiers. Warriors have the ability to add their strength to damage, and so on and so forth. That's it. It's pretty simple. I roll a d20, you roll a d20, we compare the number, we see if I get to apply damage or not. Then, if we've been applying damage, sooner or later, somebody's going to get hurt enough to actually die. And this game takes that concept and runs with it. And it's pretty cool. Rather than the player being out and deciding to, you know, go make a new character or go mope in the corner or run out for pizza or something, instead, they now have a role-playing opportunity where their specific character is going to be tested in the underworld, right? in the Twilight Realm, for the ability to not die. All right. So while the combat is waging you know, in the mortal realm, it's also being waged in the spiritual realm. 
I think that is a very satisfying aspect of the game and a huge part of the implied setting that we mentioned before. If we do survive, then people will need to rest. And again, the type of characters that you are playing are going to contribute strongly to how long you need to rest and how well you'll recover during your rests. Two-weapon fighting is also in this section. So now we're getting into like the, the less linear combative mindset where we go from initiative to range to how do I defend myself? How do I attack anyway? What happens if I take damage? How do I do damage? Now we're into the, the miscellaneous aspects of conflict. So two-weapon fighting, this is a pretty good way to handle it. There are a lot of systems out there which add big penalties to using a, an offhand and which become very finicky if you're trying to do multiple attacks in a system that as abstracts combat like D20 and related games do to the point where a roll doesn't represent a you know a single attack but rather a period of offense and defense. So in OSNR, two weapon fighting handles it that You'll make your normal attack, and then on your initiative, you get to make a second attack, but it won't be able to add any of the strength modifiers that you are due, if you are due any, and you're giving up your expertise die. All right. Similarly, we have multiple actions, and... This might, the example they give us is of a mage casting a spell, throwing a dagger, and then engaging in melee. This sounds like a pretty interesting mage, right? Not the, you know, the spindly uh, librarian that uh, some fantasy programs us to expect. So if that were the case, you could do it with the following restrictions. Each of your multiple actions is going to happen at the maximum value of the associated initiative die. So in this case, we had casting a spell, which is a d6, throwing a dagger, which is ranged, that's d4, and engaging in melee, which is a d8. So the dagger would go on 4, the spell would go on 6, and melee would go on 8. And all of those will be at hindrance, because you're doing too much in too short a period of time. There is another restriction here in that no type of action may be duplicated because, again, you're not rolling for a single discrete action. You're rolling for a period of activity that lasts the entire initiative. So that's pretty clear. Then we get into guarding. Guarding is cool. This is going on the full offense, but not only does it apply to you, it applies to your nearest ally as well. And you get to add your wisdom to your defense and their defense. And, cool part, you're assigning hindrance to your attackers. Should be pretty easy to remember, and it's tactically worth doing. Other types of actions are opposed contests, right? So this is a roll-off. So if you want to do unusual things in combat, like trip, uh, push someone in or out of range, to trick someone, to hold someone down, to disarm them, to throw them up against the wall for damage, that kind of thing. Things that people think about and systems sometimes fumble with. This is all handled by opposed roles. And so, therefore, we also have cooperative roles. And this is where you can lend an ally your expertise die. Very cool. Now, it's time to talk about leverage and hindrance. So this is a very familiar mechanic. This is rolling more than one of the die type and choosing one of them for its result. So if you have leverage, you'll roll, let's say, 2d20 and pick the die that rolled the highest number. If you have hindrance, you'll do the reverse. You'll pick the one that has the worst number, not the best number. Now this mechanic, a lot of people believe, came from Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. It would be nice if that had innovated that technique and that people were right. They don't happen to be so. This mechanic is actually fairly old. It was published before D&D 5th uh, edition in Call of Cthulhu 7th edition, but it wasn't invented for this either. 
And the earliest place that I've personally found it in print is in Fassa's Mech Warrior role-playing game, but it could even be older than that. <laughs> Regardless of where it comes from, or who invented it, or how old it is, it's simple, effective, and cool. So it's nice to find it here. It's easy to use, easy to teach, and it adds more excitement, whether you're rolling a die and then rolling it again, or rolling two dice together. So leverage and hindrance are a part of this game. Now, a game could not truly be a game by Scott Welker if it didn't include something about chases. So let's talk about chases. Chases are another area where people can have trouble. They lack confidence in their ability to run an exciting chase or escape, or they don't really know how to conceptualize it, or they overprepare, or feel like they're underprepared, or whatever the situation is, it becomes uncomfortable. And it doesn't need to be, but it does require a little bit of practice and a little bit of thought, and you can have a whole lot of fun. There's a lot of tools out there now for running chases in an interesting way way, such as with, you know, playing cards or, or whatever. But OSNR gives us a very short, just a couple of pages, with one descriptive paragraph, methodology or philosophy for running chases, which plain and simply works. What is it? Well, it gives you a series of random tables that include things that are called hazards. These are the things, the interesting things, that get in the way of you meeting your objective. Because think about this. Without the hazards, a chase is simply a comparison of your ability to travel across distance. You will either catch them or you won't. So it's rolling dice to run, for example. An escape, likewise. Am I fast enough? Do I have a high enough movement rate to get away, yes or no? There's not a lot of excitement there. So in movies, in fiction, and in role-playing, the encountering of things which interfere with your ability to do that makes or breaks the chase or escape. So what Scott has done is provided us with a series of D20 tables based on the terrain in which this activity is taking place, whether it's in a dungeon environment or an urban environment or what have you. The players will roll a D20. This will determine what they are currently facing. The game master will determine how long they feel that this chase should realistically last. A whole lot of factors will go into deciding that, such as how much time we have left in the session. So I'm not going to get into that. But what we're establishing here is that the game gives you a framework from which you can balance information that the game gives you and improvisation that you're going to apply over that. Right? So the players might roll chasm. Right? So this is a very large physical obstacle that they will need to navigate or circumnavigate. They have to figure out how to solve it. You don't. You have to figure out how to describe it. They will already know, because they play their characters, which one of them is most likely to be able to handle that particular obstacle or barrier or condition or hazard or whatever it is. So that player becomes the lead. And they're the one who's going to be responsible for doing the rolling. But they're leading the other characters through that obstacle. So no one is left behind. No one is left out. It's a chase or escape where everybody is involved. So the Game Master has determined how long this chase or escape is going to be. That choice determines how many of these rolls there are going to be. And so if the players come out on the side with the most successes, then they have achieved their objective, whether that's escaping from pursuit or catching the people that they were pursuing. Very, very simple. So we have this structure in which to improvise hazards and have the players improvise their method of trying to negotiate that particular hazard. It's easy enough to keep in your head, doesn't have a whole lot of steps, just involves looking at a particular chart and seeing what your improvisational prompt will be for the hazard that's in their way. Slick. This ends the conflict chapter, really, except for 
social combat, which I'm going to talk about with magic, just because that's the way I feel moved to discuss them. <laughs> but it talks about light, it talks about improvised weapons, the destructibility of objects, and then it takes us to the last points that we're going to talk about for this video. Favor and some advice. What is favor? Favor reminds me a lot of the destiny pool in Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars in that it is a resource that goes back and forth between the game master and the players and it's what it's actually describing. It's describing favor, a positive turn of luck for the players or in the hands of the game master a positive turn of luck for the opponents. And this pool, which is called the Well of Fortune, it contains a number of tokens. It's one token per player at the table, and it grows if there's good role play or daring deeds, creative solutions, the things that feed into the heroism, conflict, and glory that the game wants to be about. All right. And once per scene, you can alter events such as re-roll an attack or reroll tests or reroll damage, or you can also do it to retcon a specific detail. Like we don't have, and <laughs> the example given is we don't have a crowbar. We don't have a pry bar, which makes me laugh uh, because of Grimaud's crowbar. And if you don't know what that is, search for it. It may or may not be worth your time, but you can retcon an event so that you have access to something which will help you out. But to do so puts the token in the Game Master's hands, and they can use that to their benefit or to dramatic benefit later on in the session. Nice. Now, the closing advice for the chapter is similar to what we heard at the beginning, meaning that this should be a game of choices. This should be a game about heroism, conflict, and glory. But the game includes criticals and fumbles. So it's important for the game master to remember that the characters are competent, that this is fantasy, that the role of a one on a d20 doesn't indicate suddenly being afflicted with incompetence. It means that suddenly circumstances have definitely not gone your way. And a, an excellent example is given of of a bow user. It might be instinct or second nature or a common habit for people to say the bowstring snaps if you roll a one. But this strips the player of choice. They either have to forego their primary attack because of that roll of a one or use time to restring the bow. Instead, the author states, how about having them have an accident with their quiver. The arrows spill around them. They still have access to the arrows. They can still attack, but it's going to have an impact. And they have to choose what they think is the lesser of the two negative impacts. Perhaps they will have to you know, gather up one arrow at a time and it delays when their attack happens on their initiative. Or maybe they try and gather up a bunch to have in their hand to use uh, for a period of time, but now they're attacking with hindrance. Which do they prefer? Right? They get to choose, and it's an interesting choice. It's a tactical choice, and it plays into how they want to portray their character and gives them the ability to solve the problem that's applied to their character. Good advice all around, and clearly shows that the writer has played this type of game a lot, has experienced these types of frustrations, and is giving you a way to learn how to not put yourself and your players into that situation. It's kind of cool. Now this ends the conflict chapter. We'll be moving into magic next, where we'll talk about magic and social conflict. Thanks for watching.